Tenakoto. Welcome everybody to the second uh, public talk for the Waitaki Whitestone Geopark. Tonight we're coming to you obviously live uh, via Facebook um, by, in Omaru here. Um, our previous talk was at the library, however under um, Alert Level 2 we are coming to you digitally. So it's great to have you join us online. So this is our second talk tonight in a series of talks that we'll be bringing you. Um, we have a range of topics lined up. Uh, the talk for um, that launched our public talk series happened um, a month or so ago, and that was by Brian Miller uh, gave that talk, and his talk was based on Zealandia, uh, the geology uh, behind Zealandia, the formation of that continent. Um, so we do have a wide range of talks purely because the geopark is not just about geology, it's not just about the land. While our geopark tells the story of the land, it also tells the story of our whenua. It is inspires our people and visitors to learn, discover and be connected to our living planet and our cultural histories. So that together we can care for and contribute to thriving communities. So tonight we're really pleased to be able to um, bring to you Dr. Philippa Agnew. Um, so she's going to be talking about the Omaru Blue Penguin Colony. She's the scientist in resident there. Um, and the title of our talk this evening is Omaru's Little Blue Penguin from Trespasser to Icon. Now normally um, we would reserve some time at the end of our talk for some questions. We're going to be running things a little bit differently this evening. If you do have questions that you'd like us to present to Philippa, uh, we just ask that you enter those in the comment box uh, and on the Facebook page there, and then we will put those to Philippa at the end of the talk. Uh, so we'll leave a wee bit of time there. Um, so welcome, Philippa. Thank you for joining us. Um, and we hand over to you now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the history of the colony, um, the the protection that we do here to look after the penguins, and then talk a little bit about um, the research that we do as well. So yes, I've been here um, for 14 years now. Um, my role started as a varied role, uh, looking doing the guiding as well as environmental work, um, but it has become more uh, research in recent years. Um, so, so firstly, the the area here where the penguins are breeding in the quarry site, um, it, it did begin as a quarry here um, in the Omaru Harbour, um, where rock was extracted um, to to help construct um, infrastructure around the harbour. It, it, Originally, they thought the rock would be used to build the breakwater, but it was it was too crumbly, and um, so it ended up that they needed um, concrete to build the breakwater. So the the breakwater was built. Um, it, it sits basically at the at the foot of the the quarry, and it was um, finished around the eighteen seventies, eighteen eighties, and they continued to extract rock out of the harbour, out of the quarry here until the late nineteen sixties, early seventies. And after that, uh, the, the penguins started occupying the site. So after the site was disestablished um, as a working quarry. And, and it became quite controversial uh, because the local borough council wanted the quarry to remain as a quarry. And they believed um, the cement uh, industry was coming and we're going to use the quarry site um, um, after that. And in the, in the 1980s, um, they, there were actually measures put in place um, to stop the um, penguins from from residing in the quarry. So the penguins were actually fenced out, and the local uh, branch of Forest and Bird um, spent a lot of time and energy um, setting up a, a breeding area around that Boatman's Harbour uh, to help uh, give those penguins that were excluded from the quarry uh, somewhere to breed. 
but of course penguins are quite habitual in where they want um, to, to nest and continue to, to go back to a, a breeding site once they've started breeding there. Um, so there was some efforts made to allow the, the birds to continue, um, but only uh, within means of, of through the fence. So yeah, it was a bit of a, bit of a challenge and it still became really controversial um, after it made the, the local, or made the TV. And it also um, made the local, the local um, the newspaper. So it was quite interesting um, reading over some of these old um, articles at the time, because the, the borough council uh, were pretty adamant that the penguins weren't welcome in the quarry and the mayor at the time was quoted in this article saying that the, the penguins were nesting in a disused quarry and that they were trespassing in the quarry. So it was believed that this wasn't a natural site for the penguins and therefore uh, they shouldn't be breeding there. And that it was thought that the idea of, of a tourism operation here at the quarry, where it was going to continue to be an industrial site, um, was ludicrous. But luckily there were, there were people, uh, there was local councillor and then uh, people from Forest and Bird, um, the Department of Conservation that was uh, previously known um, as the Wildlife Service or and Lands and Survey. And so they sort of banded together with some really passionate locals to push for this area here to be set aside as a, as a breeding area uh, for the penguins. So that involved um, Dr. Peter Dan coming out from Phillip Island, because the, over there, there was a, a successful uh, tourism operation already, of course, um, centered around viewing the penguins um, at Phillip Island already. So he came and did a survey that started at the Waitaki River and carried on right down to Nugget Point. And he also concentrated his efforts looking around uh, the Omaru Harbour here to identify where the sites were, where the penguins uh, were occupying. And he found North of the creek, uh, there were a, a large number of, of breeding pairs, um, but it was it's quite a challenge um, that um, that environment up there. So he he saw that there were two concentrations sort of in the harbour area, and so we had he had thirty eight breeding pairs counted in the quarry here, and so that extended right through the entire quarry and down to well halfway down Waterfront Road. And then there was another concentration between the main wharf or Holmes Wharf and the Omaru Creek mouth. So his suggestion uh, was that there could be a tourism operation um, at either site because they were quite um, appropriate. And the, the site north of Holmes Wharf was actually the site of an old um, timber treatment plant. So there was a lot of cleanup required at that site. So eventually, um, not soon after that actually, uh, this site here at the quarry was established as a, as a viewing area. And um, so infrastructure was, was constructed. constructed. Um, there was a, a viewing stand that looked a little bit like a bus shelter. It seated about 20 or so people. And uh, they started operating um, tours to see, the, to see the penguins arrive in the evening. And the colony was established with nesting boxes um, there were around 80, 80 or so nesting boxes installed um, at that stage. So it has changed a little bit over the years. Um, this is a, a relatively recent photo. So, so even though it looks quite artificial now, uh, we're all about uh, managing where the people go rather than the penguins. So that's why we have uh, boardwalks constructed um, up off the ground in um, viewing areas uh, where the where people can sit and watch the penguins come ashore, so the penguins basically um, can come and go as they please, um, whereas people have to sit in the in the stand to watch. So we have um, three hundred and fifty boxes now in this main um, breeding area. So of course our main viewing uh, is at night when the penguins arrive home from sea because they spend their days either inside their nesting boxes. Uh, on land or out at sea fishing and then come home just as it starts to get dark. But we do have a day viewing option uh, where people can see the penguins sitting in, in some um, specially designed nests. And then so the other, so the other site was 
was established as well. Um, it was it was thought to be well. It was it was established as a control site basically. So over there, there there was no public access compared to here. So it was set up to ensure that the tourism operation here wasn't having a negative impact on the penguins that were the, the focus of the tourism operation. But it had a few things happen over the years, so it didn't really function perfectly as a control site. Uh, you can see from the photo there on the left, um, it had significant erosion damage over the years at, at several points through time. And, and it took a lot of the colony out um, several times uh, over the years. And more recently, uh, we've been able to extend the colony back um, and add more nesting boxes in and give them some more space. And now there's rock armouring uh, in front of that colony. So hopefully that erosion um, damage is not going to be an issue going forward. And over there, we've got 300 nesting boxes. And so I'll talk a little bit about the, the comparison between the two colonies um, shortly. But both colonies are protected. And this is why the penguins are doing, are doing well. The penguins uh, around the country tend to be declining at areas where they're not protected from, from introduced mammals and uh, disturbance, basically, and where habitat loss is occurring. So in the Omaru Harbour here, um, dogs have to be on a lead during the day, basically, from sunrise to sunset, and then they're prohibited after dark. And then, so we have um, predation potentially from um, in, in, introduced mammals, so mustelids, um, stoats, ferrets and weasels, and um, rats, of course. So we have a trapping program here uh, to get rid of those introduced animals. Uh, we provide nesting habitat, of course, in the form of nesting boxes. Um, little penguins naturally will dig a burrow into the soil or sand um, but natural sites um, are prone to collapsing or flooding and, it, and nesting boxes um, tend not to, not to do that quite so much. Sometimes they do flood a little bit, but we can manage that okay. And in recent years, we've started, well, originally there was a lot of planting done, but we've been adding to that in recent years in areas of the colony where it is a little, a little bit exposed. So potentially with the climate warming, um, the birds in future will have plenty of um, shade um, under the vegetation. And then of course the biggest one for this site here uh, at the tourism operation is about reducing disturbance. So like I mentioned, um, the penguins are free to come and go and we have that infrastructure in place um, to manage visitor access safely, well for the, from the penguins perspective, so they're not disturbing um, the penguins as they come and go. And with that, we have, we have a ban on um, electronic use. And it's not just because of the flash, it's because the, uh, the lights and things that, that cameras have these days, um, they're quite bright. And, and then sometimes there's a bit of movement as people jostle around to try and get a really neat photo. So we, just, we find it a lot simpler to um, have a complete ban on photography altogether. And so it, it is having benefits for the penguins. So as you remember from that first slide, um, or the earlier slide, it, there were 38 breeding pairs right through the quarry here and down Waterfront Road. Uh, whereas that, that number is gradually increasing. Um, last year we had over 200 breeding pairs uh, in the quarry site here. And, um, and we're probably going to head towards that this year as well. The numbers are, are tracking really, really well. So so we've seen a gradual increase through time and I'll talk a little bit about what's going on after 2015 um, shortly. Uh, but there was basically a storm event and the, the main colony here is recovering really nicely from that. But I suspect what might be happening over at the other site is that uh, the birds are probably breeding in some of that rock armouring in front of the colony. We know that because we can see the, the feathers um, after they've molted um, in the in the rocks, uh, so we're just working this year to try and um, get a, a boroscope down into those rocks and, and see what's happening because I suspect that um, this is what's been going on over there. So as well as protecting the penguins, we have a, a long-term penguin monitoring program in place, and that was established right at the very beginning. So basically every week. 
every nesting box in both this colony and the creek colony are checked and the occupants recorded. So we have a fully marked population here where all the breeding adults and the fledglings are marked um, prior to leaving the colony. Um, they used to be marked with a flipper band, but now uh, with changing technology, uh, we, we insert a microchip that's the same as what is used in cats and dogs these days. So it's a, it's a really neat way to keep track of the birds and, and the different individuals. And, and then so we know uh, how many eggs and chicks uh, are in each, each breeding pair is raising, or how many eggs are laid rather than in chicks that hatch. And then we weigh a sample these days of chicks. We used to weigh every chick in the colony, uh, but some years we're getting up to 400 chicks, so it's a lot of work. So we, we just weigh a sample of chicks. So we statistically can see uh, what's happening, and that's to compare seasons and the different colonies too. So that's really important work. And so that, that monitoring data can, can feed into a, a being able to learn a bunch of things about the penguins. Um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, my, my position has become more focused on research, and that's actually been in the last 12 years or so, um, 10 years. Uh, and that started with a colony funding uh, my PhD. And so that work uh, looked at a, a few different aspects. Because we had this really nice data set um, through time, of all those marked individuals and their, and their breeding, uh, that was going to be that was one of the focus for the PhD was to look at that data and look at the trends and breeding success and survival through time, and then also uh, try and understand a little bit of more about what was happening um, in terms of the birds going to sea. So looking at their foraging behaviour, and then finally looking at their responses to environmental variation mainly sea surface temperatures, uh, productivity, and um, storm events. So this, this population here being free from uh, disturbance and predation um, is a really, really good way to understand uh, natural processes uh, that are occurring. And it's really good to be able to share that knowledge uh, with little penguin sites elsewhere around the country that might be dealing with um, different different issues. So the, the, the research that's happening here is, is really, really important, not only to understand what's happening with these birds locally, but to share that knowledge and help um, other sites around the country. So the, the key findings from that research um, really were, were looking at the breeding success. These birds are really successful um, in terms of their breeding success. One of the unique things about little penguins is that their breeding season is highly variable. Uh, they, every season is different. Uh, they can start breeding as early as the beginning of May or as late as the end of September. And that's all driven by their food supply and, and, how, and how, much, how good their condition is. And, and so the penguins at, in this area in the south um, are able to produce two sets of of eggs and raise two sets of chicks if they start breeding early enough. So in those years where they, they begin laying eggs in the winter time, they're able to raise those two chicks from that first clutch and then lay another two sets of another two eggs um, afterwards. So they're potentially uh, raising up to four chicks in a season, uh, which is really, really good. And they also, if their eggs fail, uh, they'll lay a replacement clutch and continue to, to breed. And often too, if their, say if their mate disappears mid-season and they've had one clutch with, one, with that mate and that mate disappears, they'll proceed to find a new partner and um, raise two new chicks. Um, so they just, they carry on, they're very resilient and they, and they carry on um, making the most of that breeding opportunity. So here at Omaru, uh, the, that double brooding is really important and a key to the, the high breeding success. And in really good seasons, up to 62% of, of pairs were found to, to double brood, so to produce that second clutch. And in a good season, that, that would increase the output of chicks by 75%, so it's a really, really important. This wee photo here 
um, shows you sometimes the chicks as they get bigger and closer to fledging they like to ha all hang out together in the same box so this isn't actually all from the same clutch I think there's an adult there and four chicks hanging out in that box so it's getting a wee bit cramped and so just for comparison um, while we're talking about the the number of chicks per pair over in Phillip Island their long-term average is one uh, chick per pair so they would class a good season is maybe 1.3, 1.5 chicks per pair, whereas our long-term average is, is significantly higher than that. So 1.5 chicks would, would be a very a big disastrous year for us. So just as comparison, it shows that these birds are very successful. So this is quite a complex um, graph here that I'm gonna that I'm showing you, but just bear with me. Um, just because I just want to talk about how important that, that early onset of egg laying is and just to show you uh, when that happens and over what, what time span. So as I mentioned in some years, oh, this, is a, this is a proportion of the eggs laid per, um, through time basically, through the year and this is the data over uh, our 25 or 26 years worth of breeding. So it shows that in some years we have had early chicks, uh, early eggs rather, laid. And um, it shows that basically all of those first breeding, breeding, the first clutch of a double brood rather, are all basically laid before the middle of September. So this is what I was meaning earlier where they have to start laying um, early. Uh, to be able to produce that second brood. So the average sort of date of laying of these early eggs uh, is the middle of August. So then anything after that is basically uh, a single clutch, which are these blue lines here. And then we've got a few that are replacement clutches. So that's a successful brood after a failed first one. And then we've got the second brood of a double. So this is, this is what I mean in terms of a complex breeding strategy is that you have all these different different stages throughout the season and at any point in time through the breeding season you can have eggs and um, young chicks or chicks that are near fledging so it's very it's quite complicated so and it also means that their breeding season can last they can be laying eggs right through from the start of May till the end of December so it's a it's quite an extended breeding season and so where that where that um, where I'm heading with that is that this year is is really unusual <clears throat> in that we're we're tracking almost a month earlier than all of our years combined um, up until now. So this data shows those first clutches from all of those other years. Oops, I've had that climb. Um, compared to what's happening this season. So this season we had eggs laid uh, at the end of May, but often when we get eggs laid early, um, we might get one or two clutches for a start and then we won't see eggs laid for another two, three weeks, maybe even a month after that. But this year they all just hooked into it. We had lots of eggs laid and in June as well um, we had um, a, a significant number of peers are laying eggs. So this year is is really quite a significant year in terms of our new uh, baseline successful, what a successful season looks like. And people have asked me if it's because of COVID. And I, I honestly do not believe it is because we, we opened the centre here uh, the middle of May and we had eggs after that. And that wouldn't explain why even now we're seeing um, adults coming in at 1500 grams. They're just, they're really healthy. They're in very good condition. And that's, that's represented here in the, the egg laying that's happening. Um, so what I expect to happen is that um, we'll have a huge number of, of these peers that will carry on to double brood. And so, this again just shows you the relationship between how important um, that early egg laying is and the high proportion uh, that will go on to double brood. So this year, we're probably expecting upwards of 65%, maybe even 70 
percent of our breeding pairs um, to, to lay that second second clutch after their first chicks have fledged. And, and this year, I'm even hopeful that we might have a triple because last year we had a pair that managed to fledge chicks from three separate broods. So they, they fledged five chicks in a season, which is just incredible um, breeding activity. And there is advantages in this strategy uh, because for those early chicks because they're often heavier, their body mass is greater uh, than those uh, second brood chicks. And also uh, what, what I've found through time is that the, um, the survival rates of these, these first chicks that fledge um, are slightly higher than those later chicks as well. And so this can, this can help in terms of um, colony management. If we ever had a, a catastrophe like a storm event that happened around the time when we had those first chicks in the colony, we would know that by helping those chicks, it would be beneficial for the population because they are going to have a higher survival than, than chicks say at the very end of the season. So it, it can help us target and focus our efforts on through the season on how we, how we can potentially help the penguins, which of course we haven't had to do um, too often or until now, so that's very encouraging. So other things that I was working on for my PhD and, and will continue to do so, that's probably slightly more interesting, uh, is the foraging ecology work. So this is the interesting thing about animals that live between two environments. It's easy to figure out what's happening here on land, as I've just shown you, but at sea is a whole other story. So to learn about what they actually do at sea, we have to attach data logging devices uh, to them. So so for my PhD work, uh, it was the technology was fairly limited in, in what we could do, but I attached independently um, GPS devices to some birds and, and depth recording devices to others. So this is a GPS device here attached to a bird, and it's attached with a, a cloth tape. It's a, it sounds really crazy, attaching a device to a, a penguin with, with tape and expecting it to stay on. Um, but it's actually, it's a pretty tried and tested technology. Uh, so, so that was what we did. And this shows the attachment. So basically, you're cutting a piece of cloth to, to shape and then uh, sliding the tape underneath the feathers and then, and then bringing it up over top of the device uh, so that the device um, stays on the penguin. So, so I looked at three breeding seasons and looked at the, um, the behavior prior to breeding and then during the incubation and um, chick rearing. And so what I found was that the, the penguins tend to stay within uh, 30 k's of the coastline, um, which is in water less than 50 meters deep. So they tend to be um, preferring that shallow water. And they tend to travel north from, from the colony here, uh, traveling um, up past the Waitaki River. And you can see some of these data points here sort of disappear off um, into nothing. This is where the, the device has the batteries died partway through the trip. Um, so this bird was away for a lot longer than the device was recording for, unfortunately. And that was, that was to do with the technology at the time. They had to carry quite large batteries to, to be able to record all of this um, information. But now the technology is changing slightly, which I'll show you um, a little bit in a second. But the, the PhD work could at least um, show us where where the birds tend to to prefer, and that that was able to lead to um, things like uh, the marine spatial planning um, that we've just gone through with the Southeast Marine Protection Forum. So we were able to identify potential hotspots where the where the birds um, are, are foraging, um, representing high productivity. And then so the the separate to that the the dive um, data loggers, they're really neat too. They show you um, that um, diving activity uh, of the birds. So looking at how much time they're spending at the bottom is, is really um, the most important thing because it's the, um, the proportion of the day that they're actually 
um, pursuing fish essentially. And throughout the PhD, it was it was really interesting. Um, the the behaviour changed through the season. Um, in the summer months, they were diving a lot shallower than in the winter and spring. And this is an example here of, of in 2011, um, a female that dove 859 times um, during a day. So this is this is showing an example of what they do during the day. And the average dive duration for this for well, this particular day was 40 seconds and quite a deep um, average depth there. So probably this individual is, is diving to the bottom and because all of the dives are basically going to a, a really similar depth. Little penguins tend um, not to forage um, on the bottom, they tend to um, forage more in the water column because they, they're pursuing a, a school in fish, so they like to target uh, what's called a slender sprat or Graham's gudgeon or uh, it's basically a small fish that's about the same size as a sardine. Uh, that's their that's their preferred um, diet. So up until uh, recent times, um, it's really been just learning about about the penguins and, and what's been happening through time and over the years, and then looking at where they prefer to forage. So, so basically when you, when you do research, it just leads to more questions. And, and for me, it's really about, okay, well, what is driving that early onset of egg laying? And, and how can we predict that and, and learn from it and then potentially figure out ways of helping the penguins if need be? So um, the last two years, 2018 and 19, um, not this year, of course, because of COVID, uh, I started doing some pre-breeding tracking work and I'll pick that up again next year. So this this year I was able to, or these years I was able to use a different device that actually records uh, GPS as well as pressure and um, accelerometry and temperature. So instead of attaching devices separate um, to different individuals, I was able to attach a device that, that gave me all of that information. Um, from that one um, tracking deployment. And so in 2018, it was, it was really interesting um, to be able to look at where the birds are going pre-breeding because basically when the birds aren't here on eggs and don't need to be, uh, they, can, they would be away for a couple of weeks at a time. So the different tracks that I'm showing you exam examples of here um, were the, the yellow was from um, May of that year and they all foraged very close to the colony which was interesting and it, it might have indicated that they were going to start breeding quite early but they never did uh, that year they didn't lay eggs until the end of June in those tracks the blue was sort of late May early June and then the red track is later on in June so as, as the months progressed they were um, getting slightly further away and this track here uh, was a number of days worth. We captured the, the entire track, which was really neat. Um, I think that bird was away for about 10 days altogether. So uh, foraging all the way offshore from Timaru, which is, which is a really long way for a little penguin um, to travel. And so I need to also look at, I haven't um, managed to look at the dive data from these devices yet, but it's on my list of things um, obviously to do. And then interestingly, this year, 2019 was the same. Um, the birds were foraging very close to the colony and we had eggs at the beginning of May uh, that year. So the next question is then, okay, why were 2018 and 19 so different? Why did they lay eggs at the end of June, which still is relatively early, um, but compared to, to deciding to lay eggs at early May, in 2019. So the next um, stage of research is to figure out um, it, what, what triggers are there uh, in terms of their um, body weights. And so to come up with a really efficient way to um, measure body weights in, in the penguins, um, we uh, want to put a well we've put a way bridge um, on the holes into the colony and um, because we have this unique situation here where the, the penguins are microchipped 
and we've put readers on the fence line where the penguins enter and exit the colony. And the readers uh, just automatically record the ID um, of the penguin and the date and time. But we've gone to that next stage, working with uh, Tapari products through a local manufacturer. They manufacture way platforms for um, the uh, dairy, sheep and beef um, industries. And so I approached them and, and asked what they thought about uh, developing a way platform for, for our little penguins. But of course, uh, it's a little bit more challenging compared to having um, a cow stand on a, on a way platform and you record it weight, its weight and then it um, moves off. And I'll just show you quickly. The challenge that we have is um, sometimes them cramming in together at once, but generally, if they go through one at a time, uh, we're really hopeful that we're, we're getting some really neat work, and um, neat research rather. So at the moment we're, we're in the testing, well, in the cross-checking phase actually. So we've had this set up for a little while and what we do to, to cross-check it is, is um, download the data of the birds that have come through the way platform. And then I will physically go and find those birds in their boxes um, and weigh them by hand to cross check uh, the weight that matches and see if it matches the weight uh, that's coming through the platform. So that's all work in progress. So that one of the other really critical things that I learned from my PhD work is that um, the environmental uh, trigger that influenced the penguins the most uh, through time were storm events. These storm events tend to happen mostly in, in winter, so from between May and August. Uh, they are represented by basically strong onshore winds. It doesn't have to necessarily be um, paired with rain. It's often even just the wind would have an impact. So that wind would drive up the wave height, so that significant wave height um, is, the, is the measure, uh, starts to increase, and then and that, that significant, that wave height increasing brings sediment basically up into suspension and creating a really murky, turbid um, sea. And so what's interesting here, or unfortunately, um, if the storm, so it would, it would be storms that would continue for a number of days that would have the biggest impact. So the longer a storm continues, the murkier the sea and the further out towards the horizon that murkiness would go. And this here is, is our classic example from recent years. This was November 2018. We had a lot of rain, um, a lot of sediment being washed into the ocean and this was basically the result. So even after the storm has settled down um, and the, water, the weather's beautiful and clear, the, the sea, of course, is still this revolting brown. And so now, when, when this happens, we know immediately it's going to be bad for the penguins. They're a visual predator. They feed, like I mentioned, on those schooling fish, and they need to be able to see um, the fish, of course, to be able to catch them. And, and fish, probably the fish, the schools of fish break up when the, the sea turns this um, really d difficult colour. So we know through time that the impact is going to be um, an immediate drop in the number of penguins arriving. And I'll just show you this kind of messy graph here. So the red line is what would be classed as a normal season. So 2018, we often see these peaks and troughs. Oh, and I should say, actually, this is the number of penguins arriving during our evening viewing. So every night from basically the middle of 1993 onwards to today, we've been counting the number of penguins that arrive every evening. And, and so we can see through the arrivals uh, what, what would be classed as normal. So the normal situation leading up to the breeding season is that there are these peaks and troughs in the number of penguins arriving ashore. And then so in this, this 2015 year uh, was, we had a very significant storm event uh, that began at the end of May. 
And while it didn't last, it lasted <clears throat> maybe a week, uh, we, we had a drop in the number of penguins um, right through most of June. So it lasted a very long time. And first eggs that year uh, were laid uh, on the 11th of August, whereas the 2018 year, as I mentioned before, were laid at the end of June. So we were probably looking at the storm and the impact it had. We were probably even lucky to have eggs laid in August and not um, the end of September, like has happened in other in other years. Um, so if the if if the storm event happens mid breeding, so this year was not okay, but it didn't impact the breeding um, because it, it it just delayed it. It didn't mean that. So, so in other years where we've had storms that have happened after the birds of breeding, but have started breeding and the numbers arrive and come ashore, they also abandon the colony. So they, they stop incubating their eggs and they abandon their chicks and it's basically um, quite disastrous. And also we see reductions in adult survival uh, following those storm event years too. So I'll just bring back up this population growth um, graph because it, it shows I was able to pinpoint when we did have the most um, significant events, and they are um, 99, 2001. So you can see drops in the population numbers in those years. Uh, 2007, not so much, but 2011, uh, 13, and then definitely a massive drop in that population following that 2011, uh, 2015, sorry, uh, storm event. So we had, a, we had a reduction. Normally we have a survival rate of our adult penguins of around 85%, and that year it dropped to only 60%. Uh, so it had a pretty major impact on the population. So that's something we'll um, obviously watch quite closely going forward. Um, sometimes there's not a great deal you can do about it if the penguins stop coming ashore and then all of the penguins that are ashore abandon the colony. It's not like you can bring them all into to a rehab facility and feed them um, through the duration of the storm event. So yeah, it's, it's going to be a challenge going forward. And of course, with climate change, the prediction is that uh, these kinds of storms will increase in frequency and, and intensity. So we don't know yet what, what that will mean for the future of, of these penguin populations. Another aspect of my research in recent years has been to look at all that data collected at both of the two colonies to do what was intended and look at whether there has been an impact of, of tourism, of, of visitors here at the tourist site on the little penguins. Um, because as, as I mentioned, um, we have visitors here both during the day and in the evening. And sometimes during the day, you can see the penguins looking out from their boxes. So we know that potentially they might be aware of us. Um, and, and because we have those two really nice data sets, basically um, I was able to look at uh, breeding success, survival rates, um, chip growth, all those sorts of parameters that tell us um, how well a population is doing. And essentially there were very few differences between the two colonies. Uh, this colony here at the tourist site tracks a little bit earlier. The, the first eggs are slightly earlier uh, than, than the other site. But really, in terms of um, what this means for the populations, um, there's no, it means there's no significant difference between the two sites. While it seems they, they do track a little bit differently, uh, even in terms of that breeding success and the, the proportion of birds that then go on to double brood, uh, essentially, um, they're, they're very, very similar. So that, that gives me a great deal of confidence that what we do here at our tourist site is not impacting uh, those, those life history parameters um, of the penguins. So they're, they're doing really well here, which is really encouraging. So just to shift to a couple of other things we do, um, just to finish up, um, we have other projects, of course, that we've worked on in the last few years. So we have a rehabilitation facility now that we are able to care for sickle injured penguins of all species, so all New Zealand species. Um, so we have little penguins, yellow-eyed or crested species um, coming through. Not a huge number. Last year though, we did have 35 altogether. And we had um, 
nine uh, birds in care when we were went into lockdown. So it's been a, a busy, busy year for us in terms of um, of that work. Um, we support the Department of Conservation and their work uh, looking after the yellow-eyed penguins at um, Bushy Beach. So that includes um, trapping work, monitoring, and also uh, up until COVID, we had staff, paid staff up there every night um, working on education and advocacy. So essentially um, making sure that people were viewing the penguins uh, from the track or the viewing hide rather than going down onto the beach because as soon as you go down onto the beach to try and get close to a yellow-eyed penguin uh, It doesn't come ashore and that's of course obviously very bad for the penguins in the population there And then um, of course the underpass so for those of you who may not be aware uh, We put a we worked with a local district council and and some contractors uh, the power supply company and um South Roads and a few others to to install a system of of pipes that made one large tunnel under the road um, down here, um, 100 metres down the road, because we're at a dead end road here and there's a lot of traffic um, coming and going. So it meant that the penguins were able to get from the sea to their nests um, without having to cross the road. Um, so that was really cool. And then this year, um, our latest project is um, this new pool in our um, rehabilitation facility. So when you care for injured, sick or injured penguins, they, they tend to not preen themselves very well. And penguins, they rely on their feathers and their, and their waterproofing um, to be able to survive at sea. So we've put a pool that means that we can swim the penguins and have them be comfortable in the pool and then get out of the pool, as you can see with this little guy. And then, so they can, they often will stand at the side of the pool and preen themselves and get back in, or they stay in the water like the other little guy and preen in the pool. So it's all, it's all a very important part of the, the rehabilitation process. Uh, and yeah, it just helps encourage that preening so that when they, uh, go to see they're waterproof again, and so what's going on here? This um, this is a grate that we can lift up, and then we can put a wee gate across here, so that we can force the penguins to stay in the pool. And when we we do that, when we're pretty certain that they're ready to be released, but we just want to have a double check that that they're able to stay in the pool for two, three, four, even five hours straight uh, without getting out. And then we check their feathers and make sure that those feathers um, are still dry underneath because they have a layer of down feather under their um, external part. It's a little bit like us wearing our multi layers to keep ourselves warm. They have a waterproof outer layer and then a down layer and if the water gets through that outer layer into that down layer then we know that those birds aren't waterproof and they're not ready for life at sea. So that was really cool to have that um, happen. And other projects we have on the go, apart from like the Way platform, we've, we've just started a collaboration with um, the University of, of Zurich. So they are um, setting up um, uh, camera traps at 20 different sites around the world. And they approached us to ask us if we would be interested in being involved. So what that means is that, oh, <laughs> The uh, camera trap will be in place for a year recording footage and it will be collected um, by the university and, and made into time-lapse videos. And these videos from all the sites, all these 20 sites around the world, are going to be shown in a, in a pavilion in the Design Museum in Zurich in February 2022. So it's, it's sites like ours and other wildlife research institutions or sites where uh, there's research happening and um, there's a lot of learning about um, the wildlife and they're they're kind of interested in linking it to um, climate change and so that's the whole point of having it run for a year is to see uh, the the different seasons and what happens through time and so it's going to be really interesting not only are we going to have um, lots of penguin footage but we'll have um, fur seals and, and other animals in front of it as well. So just um, wrapping up, I think I'm probably doing okay time-wise. Oh yeah, not too bad. Okay, so a few acknowledgements. Um, 
of course, all those fantastic people that were involved at the beginning that fought for this colony to be protected, um, the Forest and Bird Society, um, Dr. Chris Lalas, uh, Peter Dan, of course, for, for coming over from, from Phillip Island. Lorraine Adams was instrumental in protecting the creek site. Helen Steed was a counsellor at the time. And there were lots and lots of other people that were involved and really enthusiastic about the penguins. And, and then it must acknowledge um, previous employees of the penguin colony and current too that just go above and beyond. Um, they're really passionate about helping the penguins. And, and then these photos, this is Dennis Dove. He was the first manager of the penguin colony. Um, he passed away in March this year, so must acknowledge the work that he did um, back in the day. And then the photo beside that, so top right here is uh, Dr. Tony Hocken. Uh, we, he also passed away a couple of years ago, but he volunteered um, to do the monitoring and then did a lot of necropsies of dead penguins to figure out the cause of death. And standing beside um, Tony is one of the dock rangers Kevin Pierce, he was a dock ranger for a long time here, he's still around. Um, then a lower right, a young photo of uh, Dave Houston. I'm sure he'll be thrilled that we show him his photo. But however, so he was uh, here um, for a long time as well, and again, volunteered a lot of time um, supporting the colony and the penguins. And then of course, we have um, Jason Gaskell, who was the manager of the penguin colony, and he was instrumental in driving uh, the research, research program that we now have and projects such as the underpass and, and helping support the work on the rehabilitation facility as well. So, yeah, hats off to a lot of people. So, it's been kind of strange sitting here in my office um, talking to myself about the penguins, hoping that there's a lot of people listening, and I'm sure there is. So, thank you all for listening. Um, and I guess now we can take questions if there are any. Yes, thank you very much, Philippa. That was absolutely fantastic. We do actually have a few questions, and if there's other listeners or viewers there that have a few questions, just type them in the comment box and I will read them out as well. So, the first question is Is the health and strength of the second clutch as good as the first? It, it is always slightly worse. The, uh, the chicks are slightly lighter and we, I guess, get more failures of eggs or chicks from that second clutch. And I guess it's because of the time pressure uh, through the season. If the, if the penguins have left that last, that second clutch quite late, there's pressure to, for them to prepare to molt because after the end of the breeding season, Penguins aren't like other birds that molt one feather at a time. They, they have a, what's called a catastrophic molt, where they grow all of their new feathers underneath the old ones and it forces the old ones out. And while they're doing that, they can't go to sea and they have to fatten up first. So there's the pressure of needing to prepare for that and then, and then do that. So sometimes we see them, I think it's almost like they make a decision just to, to stop feeding their chicks and start to prepare for that molt. So... Yeah, so then that's, that causes that second clutch to sometimes be lost. Great, thank you. The next question is a bit longer from Damien. Hi, Philippa. The other day at the harbour submissions, I think I was misunderstood. I didn't mean that penguins' numbers increased because of blue light emissions from our new streetlights. I meant their mating and nesting habits began to change at that time, similar to what Phillip Island saw in their 2016 study. Could blue light emissions be factored into the unusual mating and nesting habits of the penguins at our colony also? Um, I think that it depends on sometimes what the birds are used to. So here at the colony, we have all our lighting um, is, is that orange um, and red um, wavelength. And that's basically because um, being a marine animal predominantly, um, penguins tend to see uh, light, light um, colours of the marine environment. So they, they were, the rod, rods and cones are better adapted for seeing blues and greens rather than reds and oranges. So that's why we have all our light here in that range of the color spectrum so they can't see it um, as well. 
So if we were to introduce blue light to this colony, it would absolutely have a detrimental impact on the birds. Um, outside of the colony, I'm not really sure that the, the mating behaviour has changed and it's really hard to um, narrow impacts down to specific things because we birds outside of the colony can be really difficult to monitor because sometimes they nest deep under buildings or in rock crevices and things and we can't we can't get to them so it's very difficult to to figure out if what's happening out there is identical to what's happening in here I think it probably is just looking at the data that we've started collecting in, in the last couple of years but also they're probably more used to white light rather than orange light because they might have um, that's where they've chosen to breed and that's just what they're used to. Um, I think probably the blue light potentially could be like maybe just needs more research in terms of its impact on wildlife. Um, definitely seabirds can be affected by lots of bright lights absolutely but whether it's that blue light or just white light in general and what ranges of that light um, um, yeah we're, we're not all that sure of. Great, thank you very much. There hasn't been any more questions, um, but I give um, the visit uh, the viewers a few more minutes. Um, but there has been a comment, um, and I thought I read that out because it's um, quite cool. Pippa um, said, "This has been so interesting. She has been watching from Scotland, but she has to go to work now because it was around seven a.m. I think." Um, but um, she says, "Keep up the super um, incredible work, and thank you so much." Oh, that's awesome. What a great thing to say. That's really neat that she's watching from Scotland. Cool. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. awesome. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Totally. Um, yeah, I think I might just pass over to Sasha now. Um, if there are any more questions, just put them in and um, we can still answer them at the end. Thank you very much. Um, so, We've been, for those of you who have uh, missed the start of this uh, talk, we've been hearing from Dr. Philippa Agnew uh, talking about Omaru's little blue penguin from Trespasser to Icon. So if you've missed the start, you can catch it again um, by going to um, our website, that's whitestonegeopark.nz, and then go, uh, scrolling down to the YouTube icon. Uh, this uh, talk has been recorded and so it will eventually be uploaded. You can access it through the website or directly through YouTube if you just uh, search under Whitestone Geopark. You'll come across that. So thank you so much Dr Philippa Agnew for your talk. I feel like I have been very well educated on the penguins um, who form the colony, uh, plus those outside their immediate um, colony area. Um, and you've, you've got a fantastic website, I see penguins.co.nz, and there's lots of facts and information on there if people would like to know more. Um, and I understand you can adopt a penguin as well. What's that about? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so uh, we have had that program running for a few years now. So um, people can adopt a penguin and they get a certificate and a photo of their penguin, information about it and a little bit of information about the colony it lasts for a year and it's and it's a really neat way to be able to support um the work that we do with yeah it's, it's great people really get into it they name their penguins oh. and yeah it's it's really cool so yeah people can find out a little bit more about it on our website or um, on our facebook page as well fabulous so just encourage um people watching to jump onto that website that's penguins.co.nz or check them out on Facebook. So once again, thank you, Dr. Philippa Agnew. And we do have a wee goodie bag here. I can only show you <laughs> virtually right now. Sorry, we will That's deliver awesome. it to you. So oh, thank you. Uh, this wee bag will be full of, uh, come to you with some goodies in it. Awesome, um, nice. Shortly. Uh, and you. just to promote our next public talk that's going to be happening on Thursday, the 15th of October, if we're in level one, that will be in the Omaru Library from six to seven. If we're still in level two, then we'll see people back here on Facebook Live. 
um, and the topic and speaker uh, to be announced. So do keep an eye on our Facebook page for that. So once again, thank you to um, Dr. Philippa Agnew and your very interesting talk on the blue penguin. And for Lisa, our GeoPark coordinator, um, for managing the uh, questions and comments that came our way as well. I'll just hand back to Lisa. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, there were no further questions, so um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think if you, do you have a last, a last word or otherwise we, we say good night for today? No, just uh, thank you to whoever's out there listening um, for, yeah, for, for joining us. Awesome, yep. great, lovely. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay.